So I'm, I want to kind of set the stage and, and, and kind of preface, uh, we're going to be covering multiple technologies. And truly, uh, we are going to be talking about uh, the factory of the future. The interesting thing is to note, uh, although we're talking about a factory of the future, and I'm going to cover a lot of technologies and other trends and so forth around that. But the interesting thing is, is a lot of this stuff is now, is happening around us as we speak. It's really, really hard to, to keep in front of the, the, the advancement of technologies. Um, <laughs> so I'll start things off with a little levity here. Maybe some of you have seen this quote, but just kind of fun. The fact of the future will have only two employees, a man and a dog. The man will be there to feed the dog, and the dog will be there to keep the man from touching the equipment. Uh, an actual quote. But, you know, the caveat to that is simply, you know, technology may run the factory, ultimately, and it will, but people are still going to run technology, let's hope. Uh, I don't know if Skynet's gone active yet, but we'll, <laughs> we'll, we hope people are involved in the equation for some time to come. So these are some of the areas I'm going to, we're going to briefly cover. And, and, and this is by no means an exhaustive list. This is just touching some things of a, a whole list of really, really interesting uh, technologies out there. Um, but this is what I'm kind of seeing as the emerging technologies that are going to immediately drive this factory of the future. And you've already heard uh, speakers and, 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 and we've already, you've, all of you have already heard what some of this uh, stuff already in, 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 right here at our forum. The big data analytics, the machine learning, the operational intelligence, that's going to be, that's happening around us. You've already seen a lot of, a lot of stuff that's going on right there. It's going to get even better. And it's going to, it's going to, it's, it's really about understanding the complete, uh, the complete function, the complete, um, the, all of the elements of the manufacturing process, past, present, and future. And we're going to talk a lot, I'm going to talk a little bit about advanced robotics and intelligent automation. <clears throat> Jacob will go into that a little, in a little bit more depth. Um, <clears throat> it's all about this notion of cyber, physical cyber production systems, the digital thread. We'll, and and we'll, we'll hit on that a little bit. The, of course, the industrial, the industrial Internet of Things, um, connected assets, digital twin, uh, new business models based on digital twin, we'll, we'll touch on that a bit. Uh, this is really an interesting area. It doesn't get talked about as much. This uh, new next generation materials. We, we're, you can see what, oh, what Local Motors is doing, but that, that's just the big, that's just the tip of the iceberg. What what's coming down the road is pretty amazing in terms of uh, what we're going to be making our products out of and where we're going <clears throat> with these new tech, uh, advanced uh, materials. We'll talk about that. And of course, additive manufacturing, additive manufacturing, the hybrid hybrid manufacturing is really making an, a, an impact. And as I talk about later, it's truly out of the box. We're not making widg widgets and little hobbies things for for people. Or the hobby. We're, we're out there in the factory, which really, as you can see with what Local Motors is doing, we're out there in the factories and we're making big metal parts. Um, and then, of course, the virtual reality, <clears throat> factory environment, augmented reality. The, this has been, I won't go into this, is a little bit busy, but the reason it is is because there's so much going on. The, the emerging smart production environment, everything's connected. That's, that's been a current theme. It's been talked about a lot. Everything's connected. But it's, it's, it's the connected workers, the connected supply chain, of course, the connected products. And the technologies that we're going to talk about here for the effect of the future <clears throat> are buried in all these as you go around there, augmented reality, drones and robots in the, in the factories, advanced analytics, smart machines, self-healing systems, uh, auto, autonomous systems, all those kinds of things. It's, 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 it's on us. <clears throat> so, one of the first areas, advanced, advanced robotics and intelligent automation. It's not just, um, I, I think that the automation, which has been around for a long time, is the real, real basis, the, the automation that's in the factories and has been in the factories for a long, long time, the production systems, the automated production systems, is the, is the basis, is the foundation for, <clears throat> has uh, for us moving into this this physical cyber era um, 
Robots have been around for a long time. <clears throat> they've been in a cage. They've been in production systems since heck the 80s. Uh, in automotive, the, all the upstream stuff and body and white and paint and all that stuff has been highly automated for a long time. But those are all big robot, robotic work cells. The robots are moving out of those cells. The robots will move out of the production cells to work with humans. And it's a whole new class of robotics. Um, <clears throat> production lines, of course, being, being run by the cyber, physical cyber systems, they're able to self-optimize, self-heal, and run autonomously. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, one prerequisite, I think, for this for the IoT to work in, a, in an actual you know manufacturing environment or in any ecosystem or system of systems out there, is that the the intelligence is moving to the edge device. We're going to see more and more intelligence at the edge. A lot of the processing and, stuff and so forth is going to take, take place at the edge before it even moves down into what we call edge computing and so forth, and then, then into analytics and, and, and um, operational intelligence in those areas. So that's coming. We're going to see a lot more of that. Uh, virtual and augmented reality in manufacturing? Well, that's happening around us, and it's happening really quickly. Um, it's connecting the real, the physical, and the virtual. We've been seeing this happening for, for some time now, but it's, it's all about machines and products and, and, and all the operations. It's, um, it's connecting the virtual product design to the, to the smart production systems. Uh, and in, in the case of, I'll talk about a digital twin, it's moving be, even beyond the production systems to, to equipment in the field and, 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 and products and so forth. Um, Augmented reality is really starting to take off. Um, as we automate the assembly process itself, and we have people and workers involved, um, they're going to be using augmented reality and the, and the equipment that goes with it, the, the glasses and so forth, to install based on engineering, design, and, 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 the, and the, the models themselves right there. They're going to have that right in front of them as an overlay to the physical of, say, they're trying to put in a wire bundle or in an automobile, or they're trying to put in a, trying to wrap wire bundles and, and systems and tubing and stuff in an airplane, all uh, operational plants for maintenance and operations. Think any, any, the first impact will probably be in maintenance and operations. But it's, it depends on the, in, on the industry. So in those industries like automotive, aerospace, other manufacturing equipment, it's in the production lines, it's in the final assembly areas, things like that. And of course, there's, I have to touch on this. This has been around for a while, but it's, but it's, it's, it's gonna be a major part of going forward is this virtual simulation and validating and co virtual commissioning of production systems. So, out of manufacturing, this is, it really has moved to mainstream. So what we're seeing today, is, is, is rapid adoption by these, these industries like aerospace and defense, automotive, machinery and heavy equipment, even oil and gas and so forth, are making real parts. Airbus 350 has almost over 1,200 printed parts in it. Boeing has, has um, uh, issued patents for a whole system of printed uh, components and parts that will be a part, will be a permanent part of all all production and, fab and and fabrication assembly of aircraft going forward. So it's there, and it's and, the, and it's being it's going to be uh, growing in leaps and bounds. These hybrid machines that combine subtractive and addi additive processes are able to basically make parts that complex parts that we've never been able to make before. Uh, oil and gas folks can print a, a, a drilling head uh, on location or nearby that's very, very complex with mul you know, multiple gear clusters and, 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 and multiple lattice walls to dissipate heat and so forth. They, it's, it's, they're doing it now. So, these, so a lot of these parts, and we've been seeing them, are virtually impossible to make under the current Manufacturing processes of machining and and other processes, uh, other manufacturing fabrication processes. 
the factor of the future will run on advanced analytics. I, that's, I think that's pretty clear and pretty evident from a lot of stuff you've already seen in this forum. This, the operation, what, I think what we're going to be moving to in terms of manufacturing, a lot's been talked about predictive and prescriptive analytics, which will be a big part of this. What this really comes down to is operational intelligence. What can we do by using advanced machine learning algorithms and so forth? Because there's a huge amount of data out there. Uh, and how can we, we can use this to determine the best practices, avoid risk, optimize production. You know, this is the holy grail. We've been trying to do this for decades, but now I think we've got the tools to really get into this. The, the manufacturing process, manufacturing processes and completed records across all manufacturing both discrete and process industries. If you, I went out to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. This is by far, you talk about big data in business and other areas. Manufacturing dwarfs all of that. It is by far the largest repository of, of uh, historic data, completed records across many, many industries, especially industries that are, that are mandated to have, are constrained by regulatories, like the aerospace industry with the FAA, the pharma with the FCA, FCC and all these other, excuse me, FEA and um, all, all these other uh, regulatory bodies, they have to keep everything because they might get out of it. It's all out there. So it is largest. It's in petabytes, multiple petabytes worth of, of, of data that we can use to crunch now with our new big data, uh, our, our new uh, machine learning uh, and prescriptive and just, uh, uh, analytics that we can apply to that. So the prescriptive analytics is, is really where we're heading. And it's going to bring together multiple, um, <coughs> multiple disciplines of statistical sciences, rule-based logic, machine learning, to, to actually empirically discover and reveal, that's the thing, reveal the origins of these complex problems. Because right now, when we do r risk analysis and uh, risk assessment and and uh, all those kinds of, we, we have, we have statist statistical process control techniques that have been around for a long, long time. Now we can crunch huge amounts of records and data and come up with patterns of what we need to do to improve the process. So that's going to really change the face of manufacturing going forward. Uh, materials. <laughs> this is where it gets kind of fun and interesting. Um, there's a couple of guys over there holding up a, 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 the frame of a, of a BMW i3. I electric car. Uh, it's fi carbon fiber composite material. Uh, it's not printed, like you're going to see with local motors, but, but it's a process. You've got, you've got new materials like bioplastics and so forth that are based on nature, nature on biostructures, like bird bones and insect uh, exoskeletons. The Boeing and Airbus are currently working on the next generation of the airframe. And, and, and this, is, this is just one concept. It, it's not going to be anything like what you see flying around now. It, it's going to be completely different. And did you see that latticework structure there? That is based on a, a bird bone biostructure. It's very complex. It's very asymmetric. The only way they're going to be able to, to bake that, to fabricate that, is through additive manufacturing. It's too complex. They can't do. They couldn't do that in any other way. It, it, the weight to strength ratio is like one third less than they have currently now, and, and, and this is where they're going. You're going to see cheaper, lighter carbon fiber next generation. Uh, you're going to see nano <coughs> nanomaterials, nanocrystals, taking it right down to the quantum level. Designer designer atoms built, doing actual building blocks at at, at a molecular and atomic levels. Uh, thermal, this is really fun, thermal, thermoelectric materials <clears throat> that convert waste heat to useful electricity. So imagine a car, you're, you're using material on their, 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 I don't know, their exhaust manifolds, their muffler system, whatever. It, 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 it's, it, well, that's internal combustion engines, uh, but that's, it's, it's, it's it, maybe in a hybrid car, that's generating electricity that can be stored. But as we go to electric cars, they <laughs> that may be a moot point, but, but it's interesting what they can do. There's all kinds of uses in, in industry and in factories. The factories, for sure, electric motors and so forth that generate heat. Uh, rare earth materials for lighter electric motors and so forth. This electric ink, this is really fun. 
uh, absolutely no, no resistance, Z virtually zero resistance. So that's going to really change uh, things in terms of materials and making uh, 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 electrical components and so forth. Uh, the digital twin, and this has been talked about a little bit already in some of the other sessions and so forth, but it's really what we, we talk about the digital twin as the concept of between uh, the virtual representation and, and coming together with the physical piece of equipment out there in the field. But what it's really going to do is change business models. We know what the digital twin is, that it's, it's that virtual replication of the, of the physical product that's out there that has all the sensors and everything, and it's going to stream real-time data back and bounce it off of the, the engineering uh, designs. But manufacturers now are looking at um, uh, new business models where they, where they sell services rather than products. They'll sell subscriptions. Uh, they're, they'll have a piece of equipment out there, and they're not going to sell it. They're going to just offer a service to the uh, because they can make they can offer the customer. Well, we'll completely maintain it. So we're going to have all these smart sensors. We're going to we're going to completely um, monitor this in terms of descript, uh, prescriptive and analytics and so on, and optimize and, and and so forth. And you're this is this is an old model in a sense that you look at what the uh, the, the jet engine guys have been doing, like GE and Pratt Whitney and Rolls Royce. It's powered by the hour in a sense, and it's something they've been doing for, for a while. But now this is going to become much more widespread with the digital twin. So we, we have a new technology stack now for advanced analytics. So, and, and this, is, this is kind of a basic um, simplified kind of scheme or schematic of how this kind of works. So you've got all these data sources out there, and it can be anything, externals. This is across the entire supply chain. It can be external. Uh, supply chain uh, it be across the enterprise, across enterprise systems like PLM and ERP and CRM, all this stuff, this is warranty history service that's out of products in the field, and then everything's going to be collected. It's all connected and it's going to be collecting data. <clears throat> it's all about control and optimization coming uh, out of the customer equipment through these data sources, and then uh, we'll have data lakes, data, data repositories. <clears throat> this is the whole thing about big data. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, and as you can see, kind of the, the, the direction we've got in analytics. We've, we've had descriptive around for quite some time, diagnostic also, where we, we diagnose root causes of performance, so we're, we're, we're into pr predictive right now, detecting patterns, so we're, what we really want to get to is prescriptive, where we figure out what's wrong with predictive, and then we figure out how to fix it with prescriptive. So I want to completely shift gears here a bit and talk about the workforce it's going to take for this factory of the future. <clears throat> some, some, some points here. The factories are, will tend towards flatter management structures, and, and, and uh, you can see how that's happening. I mean, just look at local motors. <laughs> but, it's going to, but, the, but the caveat to that is you're going to have to have a much more highly skilled and IT literate workforce. There will be a kind of a basic fundamental change from doing the manufacturing with the worker to the worker monitoring the automated processes in real time and responding to the feedback so forth. So it's go going from the person who's actually the assembler, the installer, the person who's doing something out there to actually somebody's just monitoring all these, these automated systems out there um, that are self and so a lot of will be self healing and so forth. This just got talked about <coughs> on the, uh, today's panel, this morning's panel. Finding the talent to run these factories is going to be a big deal. Uh, you know, along with this new focus on educating a highly technical and competent workforce. You know, um, it's new manufacturing, folks. We're not going to bring back old manufacturing because jobs, because the old manufacturing, we've moved beyond that. And so what we're going to see here is a greater collaboration between education, government, and industry to, to make sure that those leaving secondary and higher ed and maybe, you know, community colleges, vocational tracks, that kind of stuff, are equipped with the skills that will run these future. The, according to, and again, I like to pick on the uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the most demand, uh, skilled demand job in manufacturing in the U.S. today is a CNC operator. Now, you don't bring some guy in off the street to run a five-axis mill. 
it's going to have to have some background, some education, and these things are getting much more complex. As we go into additive manufacturing, as we go into these cyber physical systems, you're going to need a much more highly educated workforce. Uh, then as these factories become more highly automated, you're going to need not the installers and the assemblers, but you're going to need this next generation of technicians they are going to monitor to support this. And then, of course, the workers in the assembly and installation that will still be there, and, there will, they, and that will still be, be uh, evident, they'll be working alongside robots and robotic assistants, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that. It's not going to be the robot in the cage anymore. Um, this is not going to be your father's workforce, believe me. So, so a few other trends before I wrap up here quickly that are driving the factory of the future. It's, it's, it's the green agenda, reduce energy, reduce waste and water, recycle, zero waste, reducing materials, protecting our, our natural resources. You know, it's all about conservation and protection. You know, we can make things, but we can't, we can't ruin the nest, so to speak. Uh, changing business models, and we talked a little bit about that because of the digital thread. Uh, changes in service life cycle and product ecosystems. Uh, these, the products now, as a part of this overall ecosystem, extends way beyond the factory walls. And this is going to change <coughs> manufacturing in many ways also. This change from mass production to mass customization. Consumer demands are being more linked directly to production systems. <laughs> Case in point again, they sound like a broken record. Look at local motors. No, they're not doing mass production, but it's, but it's, but it's, a, it's leading to maybe a mass customization at some point. And of course, just the overall change in the speed of R&D development innovation. Um, okay, just quick before I wrap up. So here's Elon's best new gigafactory for lithium ion batteries out in the desert in Sparks, Nevada. You can see the artist's rendering here, the, the whole top of the, family, the top of the factory, it just looks like one big solar panel. Um, and you got some uh, wind farm over there. This factory is projected to be zero energy. In other words, it's, it's gonna produce 50 gigawatts in annual production of batteries, and there's batteries that will produce up to 50 gigawatts worth of energy enough for 500,000 Tesla cars, and it's going to be zero energy. Now, that's the fact of the future. So, I got a slide here. I'm going to, go, I'm going to say that this belongs to Leander, and I want to have him uh, do this. I'm sorry. We're going to have him come up right after the other two speakers, and, and, and we'll go back to this. Um, so just let me close up things here real fast. Uh, so at ARC, we have a blog. We have this industrial IoT, an industry uh, 4.0 viewpoints blog. It's really a good thing. We've really been getting a lot of, uh, of input from this. We get guest blogs. We do all our ARC folks do blogs. There's a lot of really good information, so I'm giving a shameless plug for our blog. Visit it. You'll find out a lot of really interesting things that are going on. Okay, thanks. <laughs>